Great. Good morning, everyone. My name's Nathan. Hello. Uh, and I'm, I'm privileged today to be able to bring you the message uh, from Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. Uh, so, yes, I'll, I'll get myself prepared and then we'll move on. I've never, never stood up here before, so I'm looking to see where everything is. So. Thank you for bearing with me. All right, so I'm just going to pray to start, if that's okay. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to come before your people, your church, and to bring them your word. So I pray that you would help me with my words, that you would settle my nerves, and you would uh, give me clarity of speech, um, and that the words that I bring today would glorify you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So Pastor Gary, over the last few weeks, has started a, a series titled Show, So No, Grow, Go. I made sure that I wrote them down because it's quite a tongue twister. So, and the last two weeks, he's been uh, presenting on the show aspect of this series. And I've been given the, the, the what's the word I'm looking for, the task today of bringing you the word um, from Ephesians, and particularly Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. And so as I read through Ephesians in preparation to give this message, I really noticed how the, uh, this concept, this idea of show, so no, grow, go, is throughout God's Word, of course. And um, so hopefully you'll see some of, the, of these major points that Pastor Gary is, will be bringing to us throughout the year um, today also. So some basic background on Ephesians before we get into the particular passage that we're looking at. Ephesians is a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul uh, and it was written of course to the, the church in Ephesus around 60 to 61 AD. And if Jesus' death on the cross was around 30 to 36 AD, that would mean that this letter was written about 25 to 35 years after Jesus' death. So it's quite recent after Jesus had died and, and resurrected to heaven. So upon my reading of the letter of Ephesians, I was intrigued how Paul spoke to the mystery that God had revealed to him. And like most people, I like a good mystery. So I was intrigued to understand more what he meant by this mystery that he spoke of in Ephesians. Now there's numerous verses in this letter that speak in detail to this mystery. And it's not my purpose to delve into all these verses today. But two verses especially caught my attention. And here they are. I, Paul, was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan of God. The creator of all things had kept secret from the beginning. God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So I think this is a really pivotal point in the letter of Ephesians, that God's mysterious plan, as Paul calls it, that has been kept secret from the beginning of, of the time has to do with the church. That God's great plan has always been to use the church to parade his amazing wisdom to the heavenly places. Ephesians, the letter of Ephesians helps to unfold the process by which God is bringing the church to its destined purpose. This purpose that God has created for the church is a huge responsibility. But hang on, you might be thinking, how can the church display God's amazing wisdom to the heavenly places? Isn't the church just a place or a building that we gather on Sunday morning that hardly seems to be able to showcase God's manifold wisdom to anyone outside those who are inside the building? This kind of thinking that the church is merely a building we gather in on Sundays is the problem. The church was never meant to be thought of that way. 
The Greek word translated as church in the letter to Ephesians is ecclesia. The word ecclesia mean, has nothing to do with a church building. Ecclesia rather means called out ones. Ecclesia is the called out community of believers in Jesus. Ecclesia also indicates separation and sanctification or becoming holy. So the root meaning of church is not that of a building, but a group of people called out, separated by God to become holy and to glorify Him. Now, the letter of Ephesians has two major parts. The first part is the chapters 1 to 3, which deals mainly with the, the believer's position and identity in Christ, both as individuals, but more so as a community of believers. And then that rolls on to the second part of the letter, which is what we'll be talking more about today. So chapters 4 to 6 flows on from our identity in Christ to inform us how we are then to live, how we are to conduct ourselves as God's chosen people in Christ. The first verse in chapter 4 makes this obvious. I, Paul, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So bearing this in mind, let's reread the passage of Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. And as a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of people, by the craftiness of deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, that is Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. There's a lot in those five verses. So I'm hoping now to to break down the verses and talk a bit more in each. It's been said that Ephesians 4, 11 to 16 speaks to the, the maturation process of the church as it, as it is equipped to fulfill its, purpur- its purpose in the world. So let's have a look at this mature, maturing process that God is calling us to. So, verses, so verse 4, 11. So he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. It's not my purpose today to dwell at length here at each of the different leadership positions that Jesus has placed over the church. It is important to note that the different leadership roles require different gifts. But the point I wish to emphasize with this verse is that it is He, it is Jesus who is the one who appoints the leaders of the church. And if Jesus appoints these leaders, it's important that we as the church respect the roles of our appointed leaders. And as we shall see in the upcoming verses, the leaders have a God-given role in developing us within the church. And here it is. Paul, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. So we are the saints, as you know. Paul gives the message here, firstly, that church leaders have the job to equip the saints for the work of ministry. The Greek word translated here as equip is ketatomos. Pronunciation, apologies for the pronunciation. But this word ketatomos implies a recovered wholeness as when a broken limb is set back into place. And when a a discovered function, as when a physical member is properly operating. 
So, what is the recovered wholeness or the discovered function that the leaders are directing the church towards? And that here is for equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. So what are we to be equipped for? Verse 12 on goes to show that we are to be equipped for the work of ministry. But hang on, you might be thinking, I don't think I'm equipped, or I don't think I'm called into ministry. I don't think I'm called to be a pastor or a missionary. But that's not what Paul's saying here. See, we've already read that Jesus himself calls some to be leaders within the church. And their mission is to teach us and to equip us for the work of ministry. So what does the work of ministry mean then? I direct you to Ephesians 2.10, where earlier in this letter, where Paul writes, For we are his, God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Our church leaders are to equip us, to restore us to our original purpose. That is the work of ministry, the service that God has prepared for each of us beforehand. So why... I'll, I'll, I'll read this next part of the passage here. For the, so, for equipping the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of faith, and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. There's a lot in that passage, in that verse. So Jesus has instituted our church leaders, Pastor Gary, Pastor Shelley, uh, to restore us to our intended service to God, but also to build us up as a team, the body of Christ, growing in our knowledge of the Son of God, so that we may be united in the, in the faith, maturing towards fullness together, fullness being the fullness of Christ. So my question to us today is, are we leadable? I don't know if leadable is a word, but I, you, you, you see my point. And my, the definition I got for being leadable is capable of being led. Are we capable of being led as a church? If we, the church, are to attain the lofty destiny God has planned for us, we must come together with an attitude ready to learn and ready to be led. Yes, God has instituted church leaders to equip and mature us, but leaders can only lead those who are willing to be led. Are we leadable? Do we gather here each Sunday with an attitude ready to grow in the knowledge of God, or do we think that our mere attendance is enough? Moving on now to verse 4.14. As a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of people, by the craftiness in deceitful scheming. See, when we are leadable, we are able to grow in our knowledge of God and become united in one faith, we will no longer be spiritually immature, susceptible to twisted truths, to human reasoning or psychology that is not of God. We are able to stand firm on the solid ground of His Word. And the final part of this passage we have here, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head. That is Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself. As maturing believers growing in the knowledge of God through his word, rather than being tossed about by the lies of the world, we will know God's truth and we will, be able, we will be able to speak his truth in love. We will grow and mature in all aspects of our lives towards our head Christ. For it is only being connected to our head that we can grow together as a church. 
This is what God wants. He wants us to come together as his church, to be teachable, to renew our minds on his word so that our worldview is, re- is united and based on his truth. To recognize his plan has always been for the church to manifest his glory to the world, to the universe, to recognize together that we are Christ's body in the world today. Individually, we make up, we make up parts of the body And just like in a human body, the parts are ineffective when they are taken away from the rest of the body. Each of us has been given different and unique gifts, each one vital for the fullness of function of the body that is the church. So you might be thinking, I just feel like I'm a bit of a big toe. I don't really feel like I'm an important part of the body. I don't feel like I'm the heart or the eye or the mouth. I just feel like I'm, you may feel like I'm just the big toe and I have nothing to offer. But as a physio, I know how important a big toe is. Take off someone's big toe and their balance is shot. So all these little, all the different parts of the body are vital. And God has put us here, even in what we may sometimes think as, as small parts, but those small parts are only parts that each of us can do. We've all been given a, a sphere of influence that we can reach out. And I can't reach out uh, in the same way that God has gifted you. To. My final point to stress here is that we can only thrive and fulfill our God-given purpose if we stay con- connected and united together but with Christ as the head. He is what causes our growth. So to sum up, Ephesians shows us that God has an amazing plan through the church, that we are his church. And this amazing plan is to manifest his fullness to all the earth and in the heavenly realms. If we are going to partner in, in his plan, we need to be united as a body of believers in love and we need to grow in knowledge and maturity in Christ. I'm just going to pray to finish off. Father, I, I thank you for this opportunity to speak to your people today. I pray that we would come to recognize that We are not just here to gather on a Sunday and to to build each other up. Yes, we are to do those things and we are to fellowship, but you have a greater plan for us. And you have given us, uh, as Pastor Gary and Pastor Shelley, to lead us and equip us and direct us towards the bigger plan you have of manifesting, representing you and your glorious wisdom to the world and to the universe. And I thank you that you would um, give us such an opportunity. And I pray that we would grow in our knowledge and, and we would grow in this purpose. In Jesus' name, amen.